Hello, I'm Margie Brickley, a Bank Street College of Education professor. You're about to see scenes of everyday life in a classroom of four-year-olds. After each scene, I'll lead a discussion with our panel of early childhood teachers who are studying at the Graduate School at Bank Street. Each of them has just completed a year of supervised field work, which involves student teaching in a range of age groups from preschool up to fourth grade. Meet Janelle Barth, Jack Woodhull, and Josie Paul. Our aim is to give you a hands-on look at how beginning teachers learn to closely observe children and engage in reflective conversations about kids, materials, the classroom environment, and themselves. Keen observation skills and reflection on practice are two significant ways to learn about children, teaching and learning, and yourself as a growing professional. Together, they enhance practice and lead to teaching that supports young children's growth. There are three parts to this early childhood video series. In this first set of clips, we look at classroom routines and transitions. In the next two parts, we explore dramatic play and then early childhood materials. Like you, our panel members are seeing these clips for the first time. Let's join them in watching the first segment on children entering the classroom to begin the school day. Right after, we'll discuss what we have observed. Can I see the book? Oh, that you have to share while we wait for breakfast? <laughs> Which one is your favorite? The giraffe? Why is it your favorite? Because the long neck. Because of the long neck? You're right. Giraffes do have a long neck. Oh, you know what? Oh, just really like to play. Do you want to have breakfast? I thought you looked back yesterday. I read the Do you want to have breakfast? No. And so Geraldine took her, came back, and said, You had a sausage sandwich? And that's a little delicious. Did you drink anything with your sausage sandwich? No, not today. Not today? So what did you notice in this video? The first thing I notice is the teacher sitting down to look through the book with the student, with the little girl, um, starting the conversation with her. When the boy comes over, conversing with him, I mean, certainly the recognition, that contact, uh, not just kind of watching them as they go to what they do, but actually speaking, making that connection, making that personal connection. It seems like it's a way to help them transition from the home activity into school. So she's kind of getting an idea of um, how their morning was spent and then helping them transition into how their morning's going to be spent in the classroom. It looked like they were doing a warm-up activity or something to kind of just get their bodies and their brains ready. Josie, have you had experiences where the children are coming in? Do you have ways that you use to make connections with them when they first arrive in the morning? Yeah, especially when they're coming back from a long weekend. I mm. ask them, so what did you do over the weekend? Who did you see? Um, you know, tell us some things that you did with your family. Trying to get them to be more comfortable and trying to understand what they like and trying to get to know them more, I think that's a perfect opportunity. So, um, what's the difference between when you get to know the children um, and you know, when you're first meeting them? What, what makes, what's different about that relationship? I think certainly at the beginning, meeting children for the first time, say it's the beginning of the school year or you're entering a new classroom, before you've had a chance to observe extensively, your, that, the verbal interaction is really your first, it's your first window into that child's mm -hmm. personality. And it may not be the best window. Uh, and that's also a way to find that out. If you find yourself with a child that comes over to the table and you ask a question or try to engage and there is no sort of verbal response, then that certainly alerts you to, okay, I have to start looking for other ways to engage or to try and mm -hmm. not to be clinical about it, but to collect information mm -hmm. about this child. Uh, you know, following that child, that, that little girl from when she comes in the room with her mom, what are some of the things that you, that you noticed in that, her, her coming into the room? At first it seemed as if she was really excited to share the book with her teacher and um, engage in the book and the conversation about the book. 
Um, and then the one thing that stood out to me was when the teacher started engaging with the boy. She kind of just looked like a little exasperated, like, hey, we're doing something here. And I thought that that was kind of like telling of um, just the fact that she really wanted her teacher's attention. And you could see that um, she has the trust in her teacher, but that the moment it went away, she was kind of like, over here, look over here. Yeah, it makes me wonder how she is in the group with the kids, mm -hmm. how that little girl is, if she's more, if her attention and energy is more teacher directed and less maybe peer centered then, or she, maybe she has a harder time getting to work independently. Um, I think that if I had noticed that as um, a teacher in the classroom, I would have tried to find a way to engage the two children with each other so that it didn't become a conversation with one child and then another child, but perhaps yeah. a conversation at the table. Because you don't want you know the children to feel like they're fighting over it, like fighting for the teacher's attention. And it also kind of makes them get to know each other if they're playing with each other. So I think that's a good strategy now in that setting as well you know what what is it like to be the teacher at the time when when all the children are coming in and you're greeting parents and, and what's that experience like your attention's definitely divided because you want to make sure that each child as they enter the room they feel welcomed into the classroom um, some kids need a little bit more help than others to get settled in the morning so you want to make sure that you're available to as many children um, as possible so that if there is that one child who really needs um, direction that you're giving them the direction they need but mm -hmm. not spending all of your time giving them direction you're kind of floating around and making yourself available. Let's move on to cleanup which can be a challenging time for the teacher and the children. Let's see how the teacher encourages the kind of behavior she wants from the children. Yum, yum. Ah! You pick up the animals and go like that. Mason, Mason, if you knock them over like this, you knock them over like that, they can break. Remember when one of the animals lost his leg because we were too rough with them? We have to treat our toys with gentleness, okay? Remember? Rough, right, we were crashing them, and then his, he broke his leg. So you had to. I didn't broke his leg. Not you, not you. I'm not saying you. I'm saying the leg was broke because we were too rough. I didn't say you did. It could have been any of our friends. How? How did they do it? I, I think they were crashing them into one another, or maybe they were crashing them with the blocks. I know it was something. I'm not doing the puppy show. I'm the so bored. I don't want to do that. But I need, I need us to pick up these animals. Does anybody want some more snacks? I'm gonna go. I'm gonna kiss his breakfast. I need us to pick up these animals. I don't want you to play. I don't even want Cameron to play with me. I won't play with you. I'm just making sure that you pick up the animals. I'm going to walk away right now. Cameron! Hi. Cameron, can you put that back for me, please? So we've all been that, in that position that that teacher was in, right? Um, what, what's your thinking uh, as that's happening? Sometimes you just need to really think about the wording you use and how you're going to try to get the child to clean up. It's, sometimes it's not just you need to clean up that's going to, that's going to work. You need to really tell the child why it's important the way they clean up and the way they play with the materials. Like I like the strategy the teacher used in the video when she said, remember we have to be gentle mm -hmm. with, the, um, with the toys. Remember how one of the animals, they lost their leg, remember yeah. that? And even when the child started to get defensive, like she kind of like bent down to his level just to show him that, you know, I'm not blaming you and I'm just, you know, letting you know that you have to remember to be gentle with the materials so that we can play with it again. Um, just building off of your thought, Josie, I also noticed that she didn't use um, negative language. Mm -hmm. So she didn't say, don't do that or um, that's not what we do. She was just telling him, like, be careful with it. Um, when you dump them all on the floor, they, have, they can get broken. So I liked that um, she thought of a way to say it without it being a negative, without it being a don't do kind of behavior. Exactly. For, for me, as, mm -hmm. a, as the teacher, during cleanup, it's easy to get overwhelmed by, well, you actually have to clean up. But 
in the moment with the child, it's it's kind of more than that. It's it's about understanding to respect the materials, mm -hmm. and uh, I've certainly seen much less effective cleanups than uh, than that on a pretty regular basis. I thought it was, it was the fact that she stayed with him. Mm -hmm. You know that she didn't say clean up and walk away. Who knows what would have happened then, right? There was some power in that too. Yeah. In your experience with, with four-year-olds, what are some of the reasons that they, you know, dump and knock things over? Gravity is really fascinating to a <laughs> four-year-old, and the idea that he has control over the bin and can make it make it do what he wants it to do um, is just really exciting. Okay, our next discussion looks at a familiar feature to most classrooms: story time. Story is an important part of everyday life in early childhood classrooms. In this clip, we'll take a look at how the teacher and the children use this time. So once there was a peddler who sold caps. But he was not like an ordinary peddler, Jaina. Carrying his squares on his back, he carried them on. Jayla, I'm going to start it all over again. She, she, she touched back. Thank you. Can you sit on your bottom? Leon, can you sit on your bottom? Jayla. Jayla, hold on. Can you sit down? Here so you can sit as well. One, two. Sophie B, I'm going to ask you to move here. Thank you so much. First, he had on his own check cap, then a bunch of gray caps, then a bunch of brown caps, then a bunch of blue caps. On the very top, a bunch of red caps. And shouted. What did he say? You give me that cap! But the monkeys only stamped all their feet back at him and said, he walked back to town, holding caps, caps, caps for sale, 50 cent a cap, B-N-T-H-E-E-N-D. -E -E Have you found any particular challenges in your own work with children around story time? And have you found good strategies to solve them? For me, first beginning with story time, I think it's important to kind of get all the children to settle their bodies down first so that it's not a lot of stopping and you sit there and switching seats. One other thing that I really like to do before story time is once the kids seem settled, just ask is everyone in a good spot where their bodies can be steady mm -hmm. and then this way um, if kids aren't feeling steady they still have the opportunity to get up and move yeah. without disrupting the start of the story. And knowing your knowing your book well, I think is always yeah. a really big, big thing for, for read, that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, always read the book beforehand. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had the experience where you think a child is completely not listening, and then they chime in? I was noticing in the video there were a couple of kids who look like they're not paying attention, but they're clearly still engaged with the book. Wandering eyes might not necessarily mean wandering, you know, minds or attention, so not to judge too quickly on that. So. so this seemed to be the use of story during a transition time. What are your thoughts about that? I think uh, lots of transitions need, uh, you're trying sometimes to change the maybe the energy level. I know one of the classrooms I was in, we would even stop kids at the door, have them take a deep breath, mm. let it out, and then to kind of move on to the to whatever was coming next. In um, one of the pre-K classrooms that I was in, we used story time as a transition after lunch into rest time. So mm. it was um, a little bit of they got to be social and um, interact with each other during lunch. And then we had that calm down period right before we were we had the expectation that they would sit they would sit or lie down on their rest time mats. In this case, they used it as a transition. But how might you use story at other times? I remember in my pre-K class, um, the class I was student teaching in, um, they were learning about families. 
we picked out a lot of books that had families and so for story time we'd read different books about different kinds of families and they could see families who are adopted, foster families, families with one parent households. So I thought reading a book to them and them actually seeing pictures of different families was a good idea. When kids express interest in something so we had um, a day where a ladybug had flown into the classroom and the kids were just completely mesmerized by it and um, really just observing it and what is it, what is it doing, and so we looked for books in the library about ladybugs that we could share. The pre-kindergarten that I was in, one of the students brought in this, it was some sort of Halloween themed book and it really was not a very good book. I mean it just, it seemed kind of silly, but they insisted and so we read it out loud and it ended up fueling this kind of incredible dramatic play that lasted weeks and just as teachers we would not have expected this book to generate that kind of yeah just interesting output from the student. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it happens the other way right where you think this is just the best book that I have ever found for children and they are so not interested. Yeah. Yeah. Many classrooms set aside time for children to show and tell We'll now look at the interactions among the children and the teacher's role during this activity to consider what children are gaining from this activity. His friends have to turn their sounds off so that we can be able to hear Bonet speak. If we're all talking at the same time, we can hear her presentation. So let me have a seat too with my friend Mason here. Okay, here we go. Bonet, yes. are we ready? Yes. It, this is my box, and in this box, that these are the jewelries, and when and when Kira's mom came, we made something, but all of the jewelries fell, so I decided to collect them. And when Sophia got the lawn cane, there was a there was a purple jewel in here, the exact right in my hand, and there was in the, and this is the purple jewel. And then I'm ready for questions. Very good. Three questions for Bonet. Uh, Catherine. Because they're shiny. So the third question, pick another friend. White pants. So, Sophie, why do you like shiny things? Because because every time when when lights on, they shine up like lights, and when they turn off, and on. Thank you so much. So give a clap for Bonnie. Thank you. So once he sits in that chair, he can start his presentation. So one, two, three, go Daniel. Tell us more. Jordan, we're not ready for questions. Oh, yeah. Not, not going to grow. Okay. Are you ready for questions? So the second question. Mom, my mom said I can use help. No. Don't show. Um, why not you bring it? That's a great question. Why do you bring that? So the third question. Where's Karen? Why do we only talk? Just white hands. From a toy store. Okay. So in the closet. Give, give Daniel a clap. Thank you, Daniel. That was great. So the question was, what do you notice the children are getting from this activity? And I think that's a good place to start. There's so much language development happening. Um, they have to be able to put their thoughts into words. Um, they are interacting with their classmates, answering questions. It's just a really rich opportunity for them to work on their language skills. I, I certainly, I think it's such a great moment. And I think it's one that even gets lost as the years go on. You know, teachers, there's so much classroom management that can become the focus and finding moments to allow children to speak and to just get their ideas out. Sometimes you're trying to quiet them, but really they need more talking, uh, more opportunities to speak.
It seems like a lot of time in classrooms when children are speaking, they're answering questions from the teacher specifically, mm -hmm. or um, maybe it's also during play as well too, but this is actually an opportunity that they get to share something that's important to them or something that feels special to them, um, and then also explain why. For them to have the opportunity to bring something from home and to share it with their friends, they really enjoy doing things like that and to have other people hear their perspective and their ideas I think is good for children. Well one thing that struck me is that the teacher sort of gives up her chair and the student takes the chair so that the children also have a stake in respecting the rules of the rug if you will mm -hmm. that that we listen when someone's speaking that we raise a hand and we're not just doing this because the teacher tells us to but it's also how we can communicate with one another as a group. Are there specific strategies that you've seen around show and tell that you think make the experience more meaningful for children? And this is pers more personal, I don't know, but I have a daughter who's five going on six and, I rem and she refuses to do show and tell, just won't do it. Uh, it's very self-conscious. I used to try and say, we well, just pick two things a month to share. Uh, and then even gave up on that. But I think also being aware that maybe there are kids that don't want to participate in that, and it is a tricky question. How do you how do you negotiate that? I still don't have a great answer for that. Do you think that there's a way that your daughter's teachers could make it something that she felt um, more comfortable participating in? One thing I always stressed certainly with her, but I think this is something th looking at a group too, is just maybe as long as you're listening and if you ask a question, you, you still try to connect to your to other students and listen to what they're sharing and try to come up with a question, then perhaps that's sufficient. You know, you can't force somebody to public speak if, mm -hmm. they, if they don't want to uh, and, and shouldn't force them, I don't think. You know, we're talking about individual differences and how important it is to acknowledge and respect them, which we would say would be true all, all during the day, right, not just as uh, at show and tell. Can you think about how you allow for individual differences in general in your teaching? I feel as though you constantly have expectations for a group, but not everybody in the group I mean, that certainly is maybe isn't even the best thing for everybody in the group, whatever you're trying to achieve. And getting back to the beginning, thinking about that first clip is just the importance of really observing your students to get to know them as best you can, to know what they need the most. You really want to honor and respect each individual child and the individual differences they bring, but sometimes it is really challenging to figure out what those individual qualities are and how to bring them to light and let really let the kids shine. Moving in and out of the classroom, in this case to go outdoors to play, requires regular routines. How does the teacher help the children manage this transition? What do you notice about the children's self-regulation skills? Number. Okay. Find your space at the edge of the rug. We are going to call your numbers. We're playing baseball. Because Mason, Mason, have a seat so I can give you a number. Okay. Yeah, I don't have a number. Baseball's so fun. So here, here you go. Mason, I'm going to tell you the rules. I'm about to call numbers. Can you please have a seat? Thank you. Number one. Number one. Wait, please stand one, up. Two, give your number to five, Nicole. Seven, eight. And line up, please. Look at your number. Number two. Who has number two? What number do you have? You have number 13. One and a three is 13. It's mine. Number three. Number 11. A one and a one. Please line up. Number 11. Who's number 13? Yes, you are. Go give it to me. Oh. Number 14. A one and a four. Who has number 14? Awesome, Karen. Please give it to Nicole. Put your hands in the, in the air. Soft hands on. The two. Three. You're 15, right? 
I've never seen that strategy used before. Is it something that you're familiar with? And do you have thoughts about how it was used and the effectiveness? For us, I know in my pre-K class when I used to student teach there, um, we would call them if they had a color of their shirt. Like whoever's wearing a red shirt, get up. Whoever is wearing a blue shirt, line up. So I think that's where the self-regulation comes in. They have to wait and kind of just be patient mm -hmm. and line up. And even when they do line up, they have to wait for everyone to be called. So I think that is a lot of self-regulation going on there. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that because mm -hmm. it is, I mean, yeah, for number one, it's a lot of waiting by the door. Yeah, and, for and number it's 13, 19 kids, 19, right? yeah. yeah, it's a lot of waiting on the rug. <laughs> I was also surprised by how calm. It was. I was expecting it to be or feel a little bit more chaotic, but you could tell that the children really understood and mm -hmm. knew the routine. The other thing I noticed was that once they were lined up, she had a song that she sang um, as she led them out the door. And we did a lot of that with um, my pre-K students, um, whether it was transitioning outside or transitioning to another room in the building. We sang songs as we walked in the hallway and it really helped the children stay yeah. a little bit steady, stay together and a lot less of get back in line or um, yeah. having to redirect mm -hmm. children while we were going from point A to point B. So as we wrap up this part of the um, section on routines and transitions, uh, can each of you think of a particular takeaway, a particular strategy, something you observed in a child that gave you some insight into the process that you might not have had before? Just giving different kinds of ideas to line the children up and um, kind of get them to self-regulate the songs. I think those are all important. And those are some things that children can catch up on gradually and they'll get used to it and understand that this is a time and place where we have to do these certain things. Creating routines that are familiar uh, to foster a sense of feeling safe in the classroom. You know what's coming next and then, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a way to create that uh, feeling in children that uh, they know what's about to happen, there are no surprises, and that uh, the transitions can be a part of that, a part of helping them understand that and feel that way. One of the things that stood out to me from the video was just the show and tell. I haven't participated in a show and tell as a teacher, got to see mm -hmm. children do it. I remember doing it as a child and how special it felt, so I think that's a routine that I would definitely want to add into my classroom. When, I, when I'm watching the video and I'm seeing how successful some of these transitions are, I also think about how, um, what the rest of the day must look like. Uh, we talked a little bit before about when children's voices are heard throughout the day. It makes it so much easier for them to participate in these transitions and to become, to become steady, to be able to self-regulate because they know that there are going to be other opportunities yeah for them to uh, have their voice heard. Finding that balance in a, in a classroom becomes really critical so that children are able to then self-regulate when a routine or a transition demands it. That ends part one of our early childhood series. Join us for part two in which we look at dramatic play. And for more information about our graduate programs, go to bankstreet.edu.